stability never felt better. The first five miles, you're just getting warmed up. From downtown to uptown, you'll take the scenic route. Tired legs? You'll feel fresh. From first steps to final strides. Steep hills, super steep hills, long runs, even longer runs. Whatever comes, you can run through it. With stability, cushioning, and more comfort than ever, in every step. Because nothing feels better than the adaptive stability and premium comfort of the Gel Keano 30 Shoe. All right, welcome back to Sidious Mag Live. We've got another special guest, Kyle. Lined up. Lined up. Revolving like, door of stars. Yeah, I mean, every day of the World Championships, we've been sitting down with athletes, coaches, any VIPs who are in town. Shari Hawkins is joining us. Hello. It's been, what, 48 hours maybe since you got done competing, right? Yeah, is that, it feels like it's been like one hour <laughs> and I just got done competing and my ankles are swollen and I can't feel my legs still, so, but... I guess so. I yeah, feel like hours. you deserve to feel that way because you had a really great competition. That's the heptathlon. Like, yeah. Throughout that competition, I believe you either got a PB or a season best in all of your field events. Yes. If I'm wow. correct. And then also in the hurdles, you PB'd? Yeah. So I, I think I season bested. Like I did the best I've done all season in five of the seven. Um, but even my 200, I mean, we were all so dead running that too. And all of our legs were just cramping. And honestly, it was still maybe the third or fourth best 200 I've ever run in my life. So it wasn't even too bad of a time for me anyways. So yeah, it was actually, it was pretty, yeah, pretty good. Yeah, you deserve to feel like that because you PB and sprints, you PB one time and you just feel like, oh, I got hit by a bus the next day. So I can't even imagine. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, like when, when you do the best you've ever done, you actually are probably exerting the most you've ever exerted and you do that over and over. I never even thought of that. So yeah, maybe that's what it is. <laughs> we'll say that. We'll, it's not because I'm like just in terrible shape. It's actually, I'm in amazing. I just did You're so good. You're actually in that. amazing shape. So. <laughs> yeah, we'll just. <laughs> I do think that's an element of it. Like when you're in good shape, you can push yourself harder. Sure. Right? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, that's like the whole, the, that's like the whole point of like the better shape you get, the better in shape you can get because you can push yourself even harder, I guess. And then there's that other element of like, once you know you're having a good like week or whatever, two yeah. days. Yeah. <laughs> um, then it's like, all right, well, like we crushed the first five events. I guess we got to go deep on six and seven. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Honestly, uh, I think the thing that worked for me is my coach would come up to me and he'd start telling me, you know, okay, for this next event. And I'd be like, look, the next event is none of my business. And because I, I always get so in my head about what I need to do. And I'm not going to lie. Like, I think the two events where I didn't get my PB or season best, they were the two events I was the most prepared in this year. I'm being so serious. They, like if you were to ask me any time, and I think what happened is I was like, okay, I got this. Let's go. I'm ready. And then I was just all tight and you know, when you run tight, yeah. it doesn't matter how good a shape yep. you're in. If you run tight, you're out. And yeah, so you're definitely not going as I, fast or far. Yeah. And the rest of the events, I was kind of like, I didn't want to stress myself out about them because they were kind of, it was kind of Russian roulette for me this year on those. They were going to either go really good or they were just going to do what they were going to do. So I was like, I'm not going to worry about those. And look what happened. They just did so good. And it's so crazy about track. Like sometimes the best you, times you do, it's the most relaxed that you are. Absolutely. So, is there an event that you like the most and then what's your least favorite? Honestly, I have I have said that a specific event is my favorite at all times of this entire meet. I, I know like a lot of people are probably thinking like, yeah, that girl hates the 800. No, the 800 is so fun. I remember before the 800, I gave a speech to all of the girls. Wait, <laughs> oh, all right. I'm oh, being so this. serious. I hear this. <laughs> No, I am being so serious. Like you, you ask any of the girl, like every single one of them. It was like, it was like everybody was walking out to a guillotine and everybody was freaking out. And I was like, this is not going to fly. This is like, the David like, Radisha I am, I swear. And I, I promise you, I am not exaggerating. I went up to everybody and said, Hey, can I just say something? <laughs> and everybody looks up at me. And I was like, listen, you all knew what was going to happen. You, you've, you've been with me for the last few days, but I was just like, um, I just wanted to say that like 
this last two days have been brutal. I mean, all of us, the way it, we ended at 10 p.m. and we had to be at the track at 7 a.m. the next day. We all got four and five hours of sleep at night and all of us were just walking zombies doing our best. And it was a brutal competition in crazy humidity. The first day we all got up, we warmed up, we were fully warm and then we had a delay. So then we had to stay warm for an extra hour and a half. I mean, I had, I think I ran like 15 miles the first day. Oh my God. Yeah. Like that was just, just like how much we were going on day going. one. So I just told him, I was like, this has been a brutal this two days. And all of you guys have just carried yourself so well. And like, I, this is my first time making the final of a world championship 800. Usually I'm in the first heat and, um, I'm just so honored to like be running with you guys. And I, you know, I just think you guys are amazing and you know, we're a family and we're going to go out and we're going to crush it. And everybody crushed it. <laughs> and yeah. I was expecting to crush it too. You're welcome. <laughs> and everyone. I, was like, I wanted us to all crush it. And then they all crushed it. And I was like, good for everyone. <laughs> good for I'm glad everyone. you guys crushed Such it. Such a good job. <laughs> Have fun with that. And I was running and I was like, mother. <laughs> I shouldn't have gave that speech. Dang it. No, I want, the thing is, is I wanted everybody to crush it. I was just expecting to also crush it, but that's okay. The thing is, is I will say I did, I got 125 point PB. So like, I can't even like tell you like the dream of every heptathlete is to be able to run like a season worst in your 800 and still get a personal <laughs> yeah, best. Yeah. Like, I think that's the dream, like yeah. for Absolutely. sure. But, and, but I think also I've like told myself, I was like, this is like, I think what happened is the universe was like, listen, um, because I wasn't hundred percent sure if I was going to come back and do it again. And I think that the universe was like, we need to like give her reason to like want to come back. Yeah. Right. And so like, maybe it was just like all supposed to happen for a reason. But at the end of the day, I feel more proud of myself than I ever have because um, I call it the green goblin. Have you guys seen Spider-Man? Yeah. Oh, and you know, the yes. green goblin, how like he's like a good person and the green goblin comes and is like, rah, rah. Yeah. that's, I, um, this year, like I really suffered really badly with the green goblin. Like I would be doing great. And just all of a sudden I became just my own like evil twin and I can't do anything sobbing before races. I can't do it shaking throwing up like all of the things as much anxiety as you could possibly imagine and I was like what in the world is happening and I just kept at the end of the meet I would just be so disappointed in myself because it's this is supposed to be fun and I'm ruining it for myself That's you know a, you've always been really transparent about like that anxiety sure and I mean, if you want to plug your program of how you've gotten over it to be where you are yeah. today, but I know that's a, most athletes, I think, try to hide that element of being an elite athlete, but you have no problem talking about it. Yeah. Well, I think that as, as elite athletes, like we, we almost want to be super human and super heroes. We want to be, um, motivational by being indestructible. And I think what we do is we shoot ourselves in the foot because nobody's indestructible and nobody, like we all have that am I actually good enough or am I faking this or do I belong here? And uh, for me this time is I promised myself that, you know, I was going to put myself in the most like grateful state of mind. And even, I mean, in long jump, I fouled the first attempt. The second attempt, I had to take a really back behind the board jump and it was a safe jump and it was terrible. And on the last jump, I had to, I had to pull something out and I decided to sit down. I had 10 minutes and I meditated on the track. I like sit there and I did a full meditation session for 10 minutes. I got up and I felt so good. And I just was like, listen, like this is, I looked around at the stadium and I was like, this, look where you are. Like, let's tap into some gratitude right now and let's just like go jump as far as we can season best. And it's just like on the third attempt. And it wasn't one of those things where it's like, wow, you're such a, you have so much grit and you have so much. Uh, it's like, no, I just took a minute and I decided to be like, wow, like look where I am. I'm so happy to be here. And it isn't because I'm just this like powerhouse or anything like that. Like I, I cry all the time, like during, <laughs> on the track sometimes, yeah. like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, oh no, no, it's just, I think in this specific moment, I really just tapped into gratitude and it, it got me so far being able to be like, wow, I'm so grateful to be here. So I have two questions. Yeah. I've got one about USA's. So you making the team, it kind of came down to that oh, 800. Oh my gosh. Which I'm so sorry. It was not hilarious because obviously <laughs> someone was going to be heartbroken. Oh, it was, it, it was rough. It was 
a really rough thing to watch because I do train with Annie. But yeah. what was your strategy going into that 800, knowing that it really just depended on the place and how well you guys ran? Yeah, so that was crazy and that was brutal. And you know what's so interesting about, you know, like everything is like, it, like I know what it's like to be left off of a team. And it is so weird because even though I, ma I made the team, for like two or three days, like I cried a lot and I had survivor's guilt. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. and you don't ever think about that. I, I've never thought about it. Um, I, because I, and I honestly, I almost wanted to reach out to her and be like, I literally know how it feels. And like, my, my heart is almost broken under, I wish we could just all go. We all deserve to go, you know? And that's what's so hard about being a part of the USA team is there's so many, it's such such a deep core group of insanely talented humans. And that's the thing, it's, it sucks. It sucks to have to like leave that out. But it was weird going into it, honestly. Um, I knew that Annie actually, uh, because of the ranking system, she only had one HEP under her. So I knew she had a, a score to hit. So I thought she was gonna go for it. And I was like, I just need to stay within her. That was my plan. And then she, in her brain, she was like, hey, I, we already have such a good score going. I just need to follow Shari. Mm -hmm. And I, like, if I'm being honest, there was a moment where we weren't gonna hit a good time anyways. And I was like, is she gonna let me drain her score? Because I already have mine. And, uh, and I, we were like jogging. And I was like, at some point, she's gotta go, right? Knowing that she has to get it. And I was just waiting and waiting and waiting. And then all of a sudden, like, I just like blacked out, I'll be honest. And then all of a sudden we were just going and I was like, oh my gosh, we're going. And it was just so close. It was so, it was so crazy and so close. We were, and I think like, she was probably thinking the same thing. I was thinking like, what is, what the hell is she doing? Like, and I was like, what is she doing? And she's like, what is she doing? And we were really probably just like sitting there being like, so who's gonna go? I, I almost was go? like, I almost was like, so like, what's going on? <laughs> Like, like I wanted, like we were jogging happening. and I wanted to be like, this is like I mean, really slow. Were, <laughs> <laughs> that's what, for me, that's what it made, that's what made it so funny. I felt like we were warming up together. Like, <laughs> you guys were literally on just this casual jog and I could see that it was the battle of, so who's gonna make the move? Does anyone make a move? Do we just stay right here at yeah, this Yeah, it was at 120. It was, it was crazy because it was at 120 and we were, I thought we were, I don't know why I thought this, but like, I think I saw, assumed that it was gonna be like, okay, now we're gonna go. And it ended up being like, Oh, now she's going. And I was like, oh my gosh, go. <laughs> you know, so it was, just, it was so crazy. But the thing is, I think the thing that like, it just, it sucks. Like that whole situation, like I just wish like we could just all go. Like we all deserve, I wish it was just whoever makes it, these are the best people in the world. And I get that like, you know, we want people from every country and so we can only have three, but it's at the end of the day, it's like, I really do wish that it was an opportunity that like anybody who qualified to go could go. Like, I really do believe that, that that it would be so much nicer. Absolutely. You guys got so much talent. And then my second question goes into the long jump. So what happened in the long jump with Talia Brooks, oh. a lot of people who don't understand the multis in general yeah. don't necessarily understand what happens if you take three fouls yeah. in the long jump or in any event, if you scratch out or bell out or no mark or no time in those events. And so I wanted to ask if you could explain that for the people that don't know. I Sh asked this the other day. Sure. So I was like, why don't you just really, like you, I guess, did on your second jump, get that safe mark. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, like, I don't think that we could probably even know what was going on in her head. Um, the only thing that I can liken it unto is, like, do you guys, I don't know if you guys remember indoor last year, but I, would, I did that at Worlds mm -hmm. in Serbia. Um, I was in third place and Kendall was under me by, I think it was 160 points. And, uh, so I had a green light, like ready for my medal. And, uh, but, and I was jumping well and I was scooting back and I, my coach, the coach kept just saying like, take a foot back and I would take a foot back, but there was, there's just something in you. That's just, you're so used to the board. You know, you're so used to it. So when you are further back than you think, you naturally, you reach naturally reach it. out in your last three steps. You naturally, you know, it, and sometimes it just happens. And, uh, you know, 
it, it's so it's so hard. Like that's what happened with me this year when I filed my first one. I was like, listen, I'm not doing that again. Like I know how it feels. I know what it's like, and I'm gonna. I'm in this still and I'm going to take a, and I went so slow at that board and I was like, I don't care, whatever, whatever happens, I'm not letting this happen again. And she, she just, I think in her brain, she wanted that bronze and she knew if I want to get, if I want to get like, this is metal or bust and I'm going to go for it. And so she put all of her power and all of her speed and all of her heart on the board. And sometimes like the math doesn't math you know, and it, in like the geometry isn't what you thought it was going to be. And you may hit, yeah. you may hit this mark, but then you may push too hard past it because you're just so intense. And I like to say, you know, with the eight, um, I'm in the best shape of my life. I am like, but you know, sometimes just like, just like with javelin, I've had gorgeous throws, but then I get in, in warmups and then you get into the meat and you tighten up and you throw terrible. Right. And when you run and you run tight and, and sometimes it's technical and it could have been technical, you know, like she could have hit her perfect marks, but then she was rolling way too fast. That was such a fast track. You know, there's so many things that could happen. And what I told her, um, afterwards is I just said, like, listen, like, I want you to identify yourself as a seven meter jumper because you are, yeah. because you're incredibly talented and you're amazing. And that's who you need to like resonate with. Don't resonate with the girl who fouls three times, because if you do, you're going to continue word. to do that. Yes. Like, and the same thing with me is like, I want to resonate myself with the girl who does season bests over and over personal bests over and over and over when it counts and not the girl who runs 222 right and it's like and I know me and I know that I can run faster but I also know that I haven't been jumping well in high jump all year and boom when it came down to it I was able to do it right and that's just the way the hep goes is I think a lot of times like we assume that it's so easy but because we're watching people do it. And it's like, oh, that'd be fun. I could do all of those things. But your body's exhausted. Talia was probably also focused on three hours of sleep. Yeah. And so yeah. in her brain, like you gotta, 100%. you gotta know, like, it, and I, I always hate people who say, you know, like, oh, like that's just mental toughness. That's just not like, that's not disciplined. It's like, no, like she's so fast and it's a fast track. She wants it. She's hungry. She's going for it. And she has no sleep in her in her brain, you know? Something I think is interesting with the multis, more so than any event, there's so many storylines going. Just, you know, seven yeah. events across the board, so many athletes, two days, and hearing the story about USAs, from a fan's perspective, it can be really difficult to follow. Yeah. But then you see the live updates during the 800 and how much more exciting being able to tell that story. I guess for you how do you describe like the HEP to those who maybe aren't super familiar coming from other sides of track and field and what else can be done to make it more presentable to a wider audience? Yeah. So I think that a lot of times people assume that heptathletes are the people who weren't good enough at one sport. So they had to kind of do all of them, but realistically the so heptathletes are the people, I mean, let's talk about Anna. Like, <laughs> like I mean, come on. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is like, it's the, the heptathlon is for people who are just insanely well-rounded, you know? Yeah. And the thing that's super fun about it is you have to have, I mean, I've had nine and 10 hour practice days because you can't just show up for an hour and a half. Like, what are you going to be able to practice one event and then go home? there all day. Yeah. So you gotta, you gotta, nine to five. <laughs> all day. yeah, like, it's literally. a full, it is a full-time job, but it's so fun because there's a lot of variety and you, you, there's a lot of good stuff, but it's also just, it's tiring and um, a lot of laundry. Yeah. So, so much laundry. <laughs> you were saying like I, before day two, you had to pack your bag and it's like, we all took us, duffel like, bags. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. To the track. there was, there was no <laughs> backpack. Yeah, yeah. There was no backpack. It was a full duffel bag. I put actually, they have a, they had like little cubicles, uh, for us with mattresses, uh, because we had, we had to stay there all day. We couldn't like go back to the track. Oh. So like we, <laughs> yeah, so we got there, we got there, uh, at eight, at 7 45 AM the first day and we left at 10 PM and then, uh, went home. Um, I got home at 10 30. I had to eat. I had to go home and shower. And then I had to take that huge duffel bag that had all my stuff. And I had to take, it's all chaotic, right? Because it's, I've been using it in and out all day. So it's all just 
you know, when you get home from a big trip yeah. and you have to unpack that huge shuffle bag. The worst. Oh my gosh, I can't even imagine. Yeah. <laughs> like, that just, when, once you compared it to that, I'm like, that's actually. Yeah, well then now, impulsive. but then now pack it again. Now you have to repack for the next day. Oh my gosh. But then now you also have to go to sleep because you got to get up at 5 a.m. Because you have a competition. You have to be there at 7.15. In the morning. Eat? How do you eat through all this? The, especially the late night finish, early morning start the next day. But like, are you packing a pizza with you when yeah, you're so at the track for 10 hours? The great thing about Worlds this year is um, during our break, they did serve us lunch. Okay. So, Something yes, nice. yeah. So they had like buffet style. So really? they had pasta, rice, chicken, fish, like all of that kind did of you stuff. you eat fish That's before beautiful. they ate? No, no, it's not right before. <laughs> so it's at like, so we they feed us one meal. So okay. we get there and then we'll have like, you know, they have bars. We ha we'll have bars. We have fruit. We have all those things that we snack on all the day. And then we'll have one big meal right before the break. And then they have showers for us. So we'll take a shower. And then I brought my comforter from the hotel <laughs> and my pillow oh my and put goodness. it on my mattress and then tried to take a, a nap. Like I actually, um, I put, you know, those like heatless curler yes, things. Yes. I literally put the heatless curler things, my hair up. <laughs> you, why didn't you look up? Why did you ask hair? Jasmine? Pajamas. <laughs> like put my pajamas on, put the heatless. And I was like walking around in like slippers and like, in like, and everybody's like, you look like you're going to like a slumber party. I was like, is this not a slumber party? I thought it was. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is one that's like what we're doing party. here, right? Like we're all just like best friends at a slumber party. That's what it is. I love that. And especially because you guys do spend all day together. You guys spend two yeah. days together. And I think one of the things that I love about watching the multis in general is seeing how you guys come together at the end where yeah. it's not just one person takes that victory lap. You all take that victory lap. So what did that mean to you that you were a part of taking in that big victory lap? Yeah, I mean, that's. I think that that's a pretty much a tradition for every heptathlon you do ever. And it's just one of those things where it's that celebration of like, we just went to war and we all survived. Like these are the people who survived the war. You know what I mean? Um, Cause we, it's like, we lost some soldiers along the way, but these are, these are the people, these are the people who made it kind of a thing. And so it's, it's a, uh, it's so fun. And I think that we're all like, kind of just like pumped full of adrenaline and, um, at Budapest, I mean, the crowd was wild for your victory insane. lap. Wow, it was crazy. The yeah, like the thing is, the crowd in Budapest is just unreal, and so we were all and the lights are out because it's the evening session, and you just like you know the song like Hey Now, Hey yeah. Now. Yeah. It's like this is what dreams. <laughs> it's like that's how you feel when you're in there. And I remember there it's was totally actually dark. there was yeah. a girl from um, from France who was really upset with like how she did. Like she was just so upset and she was crying and. I was like, hey, are these happy tears? And she was like, no. And I was like, okay, <laughs> listen. And she was young. She was super young. And I, I, like, I put my hands on her shoulders and I was like, listen to me right now. And I was like, I want you to first close your eyes. She closed her eyes. I said, I just want you to listen. And I was like, everybody right now is cheering for you right now. And they are all, they all, if they could snap their fingers and trade places with you, they would right now. And I was like, and I was like, now I want you to look. I said, look where you are. And I was like, 18 of us or 24 of us, 24 of us, there were 18 that finished, but 24 of us got the opportunity to be here right now. And I was like, there's going to be so much time to be upset. Believe me, there's gonna be times to be upset about your performance, like, and things you wish you would have done differently and things that are good. But right now, don't give, don't throw this part away. Like we let's do this lap and like, let's do it. And she was like, okay. And I held her hand and like, it was super cool. But like, sometimes you really just need like sorry to, for the people. Yeah, I love it. Like what? It's like they're calling the the pre eight hundred speech like the Hawkins address. Like, I literally, literally I love go down it. In history. I feel like we all need those type of people that we're surrounded by to be able to speak life into other athletes because a lot of the times you get here and your heart <laughs> and you get you do get heartbroken because you might not hit the accomplishment and you have these big goals. And so to have another athlete be by your side and be like, Hey, I know that we're upset, but let's remember where we are. And we're such a small fraction of people that make it to this level and not yeah. everyone gets to experience that. So shout out to you, Shari. I yeah. love that for you. Yeah. Well, and I think that there, are, I mean, maybe there will be teams that she doesn't make in the future that, will that will actually click because I think that there's just been so many times where I have been 
I have been unable to take that lap. Yeah. You know, like I, I didn't get a chance. Like, and I would have loved to take that lap even if I, oh man, I would love to have taken dead last at the Olympics, but I didn't make the team. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I would have loved to do that lap taken dead last and just the worst meet of my life. But like, I'm just sitting there at the Olympics. Like, ah, I would have loved to be able to do that, you know? So it's like when you're in that moment, like sometimes you got to throw away like detach yourself for just a second from your performance and like really feel into who you are and where you are. And like that, sometimes you just got That's what you got to do. Yeah. Less than a year until you can hopefully feel that moment. Yeah. Yeah. We'll I see. Know. We'll see. So uh, talking about that disappointment, you are an elite athlete, very public persona, popular on social media. How do you balance the persona that you know, helping other people and, you know, being that motivator that you naturally are. And then also, I guess, keeping it reserved a little bit, keeping to yourself, you don't want to show the whole world everything or do you, I don't know. Like, how do you balance that as yeah. an athlete? Yeah. My coach always says like, uh, you can have all the information. It's about applying it. So like, even if I gave everybody the information, like if they apply it or if they don't apply it, that's kind of like on them. And if they're willing to apply it, like none of the stuff that I'm like, really talking about, like maybe I'm putting in a perspective that people might understand more, but realistically, I, I'd love to be able to share it so that people can have the opportunity to apply it. But like, it's kind of like one of those things you can lead them to the water, but you can't make them drink kind of a thing. So like, it's okay if they have all the information, but it doesn't necessarily mean like, it's kind of hard. It's hard to do what we do, right? Like when, when we do it. So you can teach them to a skip. Yeah, exactly. Is anyone in the world the better skip. at A and B skips right, than, you? than you? I mean, probably. Uh, to I be know. honest, <laughs> <laughs> there's probably people way more the qualified. Drill BCG than like honestly, one of the things I think that you have done mm -hmm. so beautifully, you and Tara Davis, you guys have marketed yourselves on social media and have learned to use that platform and amplify yourselves and sell yourselves not only just on the track but as athletes and as humans. What was that process like and how did you get into social media? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I was just wondering, like, when was the sort of like the tipping point where it's like you're you're putting all this effort in and like, you know, accumulating followers and stuff. But then like now to see like how many you have, like there must have been like a point where it's like, oh, now they're coming in masses and droves. Yeah, yeah. I think my I think my story is interesting but I, I mean maybe maybe boring but uh when I first went pro I just I moved to Santa Barbara and it was so expensive and I was work I had to work and I was kind of like I don't think I'm ever going to get a sponsor by just being a heptathlete like we're not really on tv that much we're not really that popular and I think I got to go the social media route and I had 700 followers they were all like my family like in France, you know what big, I mean? Like family. they were like the people from college and like my aunts, you know, I mean, that was like basically who followed me. But I was like, I think I need to, I need to kind of start working on social media. So that was back in 2015, way back in the day. And uh, way back when, way back Caitlin. when, <laughs> way back when, eight years ago, that's like a long time. And uh, I, I think honestly, it all started out of like hashtags. I would go to hashtags and like track and field hashtag. And I would just like start liking and commenting on people and really actually being social media of social media. Like being part of the social part of social media and connecting yeah. with people and being like, oh, really cool. Oh, we should race. Like all of those kinds of things and started doing it that way and finding people. Um, and then it actually really started progressing more than I thought it would because my coach wanted us to create a journal and I didn't want to write down. I just, so I did video journals for track. So I would post just my, um, my high jump, for, uh, my high jumps of the day. And then I would write down all of the notes to remember. And that's kind of how it started. Wow. And uh, then all of a sudden, do you remember when videos used to just be likes yes. and then they turned to views? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And then I remember when they turned to views, I didn't ever notice this, but because they never got liked, but they started getting views, they were getting kind of a lot of views. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God goodness, I don't have that many followers and like that they're, I'm getting, so I was like, okay, videos, videos, videos. And then, you know, um, I ended up making the Thorpe cup team in 2017. So I posted, you know, my OG like hands on the hips in my team USA <laughs> uniform and posted, it was like on my way to Germany and turned off my phone and went to Germany. And I think I had like 3000 followers at that time or something like that. And I got landed on Germany and I had 10,000 followers. <laughs> Oh my! When goodness. I landed in Germany, 
<laughs> so, and I was like, what in the world? And by the time I left Germ Germany, I think I, think I had I remember like, that picture yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> OG, OG in the house. Yeah, so funny. And then ever since then, you know, I ended up moving to England and getting my master's degree in England and training over there. And so I got a really big British following just because I think people loved a USA girl and talking about their country. Like, and I'd be like, hey, why do you guys call it aluminum? That's really weird, it's <laughs> aluminum. You know, kind I of a thing. I aluminum for a little bit, yeah. Yeah, and then, it, and then it just kind of like, from then it just kind of like was one of those things where, um, but then, you know, I will be honest, like I have an incredible team behind me now that really helps me grow. Like I have an amazing photographer. I have an amazing like manager, like I have an amazing like just team behind me now that really helps me get like incredible content and being able to you know it we kind of changed I remember do you remember when it was like very like hashtag track girl yeah and it was like girls yep. like in like they're in like they're like they're we were just like all like this you know Show the butt and the we butt. were just kind of like that was I felt like that was like kind of like where I was I felt like I was starting to head down when I was in England and I made this active choice I was like you know like this is just like not it for me like I this is I hate I hate this with all my heart and I was like I need to rebrand I need to like do something else and I tried to go just kind of the more inspiration thing and that didn't really do much for me and so then I kind of got into teaching um when reels came out and mm -hmm. that was kind of like my bread that and butter clicked. yeah yeah that definitely clicked for you and I my edu my master's is in education so it's just kind of right up my alley and I think that that was kind of what did it for me to be honest so you're in San Diego yeah and at the training center not too long ago maybe about a month or two ago we had a group of girls come down to the training center and actually like not athletes at all okay came and did the decathlon why they chose to do the decathlon and not the HEP was absolutely insane. So they want to do it again. Would you be willing to come? Do a decathlon? You don't have to participate, but help teach them because <laughs> I couldn't teach these girls. And I was just like, oh, I can help you guys with long jump and sprints and that's it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I could be any help, but like maybe like I would come <laughs> and I'd be like, I'd want, I'd want to do like a whole like psych eval on them and make sure they were <laughs> okay. Sure they're not okay. <laughs> These girls are not okay, but they're the most fun group of girls that I've that's really met cool. in a long time. Yeah, that's super cool. And I think they found the new appreciation. Do you think more people should just kind of start doing it? Doing the decathlon? Yeah, or the hell. No. <laughs> No, don't Just do it. In. Don't do it. <laughs> Just you're anti. It's horrible. Like, no. It's it's I miserable. The <laughs> because Jordan Gray is really big on yeah. the woman doing the decathlon, sure, right? And bringing sure. that in. What are your thoughts on the decathlon? Listen, <laughs> listen. Yeah. For I'm, someone else, it looks for good someone on who's anti-heptathlon. I don't know why. I, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> the thing is, is I actually talked to Jordan. Like she loves it. I, like I love talk. I love watching people be elite at like what they do and like following their own passions. Like it's the same thing that I think about with like hundred milers when they just love it. And they're just like, oh my gosh, I did like 30 Ironmans. I'm like, <laughs> goodness gracious, tell me more. But like, no, I will not do it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Like I got to tell you guys, I was done with the, and to be fair, we were, we were there all day. And so that could be one of the things, but I did four events in a day. I could not feel my legs. I was seriously like so dead. I was, cr my legs were cramping up. Like how did, how do they do five in a day? And then they show up the next day and do five. I don't know. They get more sleep. Uh, maybe. And I don't want to know. Yeah, they get more they let sleep. Them sleep. I wonder, I wonder what, <laughs> what the schedule, I actually don't, I didn't even look, look at the schedule. Yeah. I hope so because people are wild. <laughs> sure. Is that it for the season? Or are we all done? Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, yeah. Okay. You didn't <laughs> want to go to Pan Am's? You didn't want to wait until you know, October? Do you know what? Oh my gosh. Do you know what's crazy is like uh, when we were going to Worlds, I was like, I was trying to do two things. The first thing is you want to stay in the present, right? And you want to be like, we're working now and we're ready and we're going. But then you're also like, oh my gosh, I'm going to eat this when I'm done. And I'm going to like do these fun things. And my family would be like, hey, like we're going to go to like a concert. Do you want to come? And I'm like, I, I can't go. <laughs> I have to train. I Swift? have to train and get 10 hours of sleep. Even if so. it's Taylor Swift. Oh my gosh. I, do you know what's crazy is Taylor Swift is playing in London in like three days after the Olympics is over. 
Oh. And oh. and so it, like so we're, it, Olympus is in Paris. Like go to London and like um yes yeah. right. And I'm like I think that that's like something that probably should happen. Your motivation yeah. to make it's the like Olympics. one of those things I have to make the Olympics so I can go to <laughs> so the error go. store. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like the only right that's thing to do. the actual motivation. <laughs> Screw the Olympics. <laughs> but uh, wait, can we not make that be the soundbite? Like I feel like <laughs> I feel like we shouldn't like take that out of context. Yeah. Like let's no not context. let's not. Be like, how does how do you feel? Like you guys be like, how do you feel about the Olympics? Screw the Olympics! Screw the Olympics. <laughs> Look me in the eyes. I'm only here for Taylor Swift. Yeah. <laughs> They'd be like, hey, Shari's banned for the Olympics. <laughs> actually, like the actual uh, Olympics are like, no, she's banned. I actually right. like that. Try yeah, play hard to get. Yeah. I, I, I'm trying for I, you. You try for me. I'm not going to lie. Can I tell you guys, this is actually probably like, this was the wrong decision. Like, don't do this. But I was so worried going into the Olympics, uh, like going into the Olympic trials. And, you know, when you get so scared, like, I'm not going to make it. Like, I'm not going to make it. And I was like thinking, you know, it's when they say like with like law of attraction, like you attract what you desire. So I like you track what you're feeling. And I'm like, oh, I really, cause I was feeling horrible. So I was like, I really don't want to go to the Olympics. <laughs> I was trying to reverse psychology of the universe. Like truly, I was trying to reverse psychology of the universe. Didn't work. Don't do that. If I get invited, we'll see. We'll see what I have that week. That, but when I tell you guys, like, I'm not like, I wasn't doing it sarcastically. Like that was dead serious. <laughs> Me being like, yep, don't want to go. Don't want to go. Don't like, the that sounds horrible to team. me. Everybody there is going to get COVID. <laughs> like, and so it would just be horrible if I went and I'd probably die if I went there. Like that was, that was me being like dead in like med like with meditation music playing like me, like really just sending it into the universe <laughs> being like, yeah, yeah, no, I don't yeah, want to go. The universe oh. was like, okay. And then, oh, oh, and then I didn't go. <laughs> so, so I don't think reverse psychology, I don't think the universe <laughs> does reverse psychology. I should write a book about that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Oh yeah, that's God. good. <laughs> well, sorry, this, was, this was really fun. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your time in Budapest. Yeah. Maybe go over to the bath. I have something. a question for you guys. Who oh. are you excited? Who are you excited to see? Like, what? What are you excited to see now? Yeah. Now that now that I'm yeah. done competing. Right. Now that you're done. Yeah. The interview has flipped. <laughs> um, well, tonight we have the women's 1500. Every Oof. time 5th KPA oh my steps gosh. on the track, that's a treat. Yeah, I mean, I'm still riding the high from last night. Shakira Richardson winning. That was that not the cutest thing? That was so cool. <laughs> like, I was so I, I was like, I want to bottle up like her, like looking up like this, and I want to just like bottle it up and sell it. Like that was the cutest thing I've ever seen in my whole life. It was so cute because it seemed like she was in such disbelief. Like you could tell it hadn't truly hit her yet. Oh, she realized what she did, but. I think today, after waking up, she's truly gonna be like, "Dang, I really did that." That's so great. So that I is true. See her dude in the two hundred. Yeah, as well. yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's gonna that's be fun. I got the chills. I got the chills. Yeah. I'm really excited to watch both the men and women's two hundred. Mm -hmm. But for today, I'm excited to watch the women's discus. Yeah. Our girl Val Almond. Oh yeah. <gasps> come out with a gold, hopefully. Yeah. My great. gosh. So many gold medals for Team USA. So We're far. off to a good <laughs> first <laughs> to a great start. few days. Yeah. 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 Super fun. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah. This was awesome. Of course. Really fun. Thanks, Shari. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. This was fun. All right. We will be back next with the Backstreet Boys. Nice Ooh. little collab. <laughs> E6. Sound mind, sound body. 365 days. One year until history is made. A lifetime of preparation that will lead us to the ultimate test. 365 days until we show the world what a sound mind and a sound body can do. See you in Paris. E6. Sound mind, sound body. 365 days. One year until history is made. A lifetime of preparation that will lead us to the ultimate test. 365 days until we show the world what a sound mind and a sound body can do. See you in Paris. 
stability never felt better. The first five miles, you're just getting warmed up. From downtown to uptown, you'll take the scenic route. Tired legs? You'll feel fresh. From first steps to final strides. Steep hills, super steep hills, long runs, even longer runs. Whatever comes, you can run through it. With stability, cushioning, and more comfort than ever, in every step. Because nothing feels better than the adaptive stability and premium comfort of the Gel Keanu 30 shoe. E6, sound mind, sound body. 365 days. One year until history is made. A lifetime of preparation that will lead us to the ultimate test. 365 days until we show the world what a sound mind and a sound body can do. See you in Paris. Stability never felt better. The first five miles, you're just getting warmed up. From downtown to uptown, you'll take the scenic route. Tired legs? You'll feel fresh. From first steps to final strides. Steep hills, super steep hills, long runs, even longer runs. Whatever comes, you can run through it. With stability, cushioning, and more comfort than ever in every step. Because nothing feels better than the adaptive stability and premium comfort of the Gel Keanu 30 shoe.
stability never felt better. The first five miles, you're just getting warmed up. From downtown to uptown, you'll take the scenic route. Tired legs? You'll feel fresh. From first steps to final strides. Steep hills, super steep hills, long runs, even longer runs. Whatever comes, you can run through it with stability, cushioning, and more comfort than ever in every step. Because nothing feels better than the adaptive stability and premium comfort of the Gel Keanu 30 Shoe. Back straight, back. All, All right. right. <laughs> All right, we are back on City of Smack Live, presented by ASICS. Uh, we've been, uh, this morning was the Media 800. How did the spikes feel? Oh, man. I mean, I I ran faster than last year. When there I, you go. So it was a fun race, felt good, looked good, <laughs> exhausted now. But, hey, you know, ASICS it worked. kitted us up, looked yeah. good, ran Okay, I ran. I ran well. <laughs> you actually ran way better. Yeah, yeah. I think I tied my PR, yeah. which, is, which is very exciting. So thanks to Asics for their support of all of our coverage of the World Championships. They've got tons of athletes out here. Actually, I just got word that we might be getting a, one of their big ones tomorrow. Ooh. Mr. Fred Curley may be stopping by. So name dropping. Yeah, if now you've been watching. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I really hope he shows up. But right now we are joined by the Backstreet Boys, Jody and Bayo. Oh. I've been waiting for this collab, and you know, it's kind of been, cr what was really funny is when we were walking t to the stadium, we were like, this is the first time we've met in person, right? Because, dude, we've known you, and this is the thing, isn't it? Like, especially nowadays, everything's online, everything's on Twitter. We've been talking to you for probably eight years. Ten years, <laughs> ten years I think. I think like 2013, around that time, is when we probably started following each other. And yeah. it was like, we were on the tram um, on the way, so, and I was like, that's Chris. <laughs> 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 you obviously that's him, that's him. <laughs> He was taller in person. <laughs> but, we were, but we were also all on the wrong track, weren't we? So yeah, we had to bond time for getting lost. <laughs> it's an ongoing issue. Huh? It's not that far to the stadium, but we can't But there was a there. B. It was the 2B tram. We just yeah. needed the 2. It's so. been so confusing. It's not as easy as New York. So for you guys, first... Sorry, it's well, much easier than New York. No, it's not. <laughs> New York... Paris is the worst, but New York is not a, not a good transport system. Sorry. Oh, it makes no know. sense. It's all we know. It makes no sense. You have fast trains. You the have the times I've got on a train and ended up in completely the wrong place yeah, in New York. Yeah. And we have rats. So. <laughs> <laughs> there's, that, there's that too. But for you guys, first world champs that you're attending in, in 10 years, right? So uh, we did what well, was As in London. media, right? As media, yeah. It was in London um, in 2017. That's right. Uh, we did go. We didn't, I don't think we even applied for media did we can't remember um but we didn't in in london we always have this thing we have great championships in in, in britain mm -hmm. but they always do a lottery for the tickets now us hardcore you know fans we want seats on the finishing line i don't care how much i pay you know we, we will have those tickets you couldn't do that in london it was a lottery you could get certain seatings when you you know certain days and certain you didn't sessions. even know sometimes what seat you were going to yeah. get and we're like absolutely so not we decided we weren't going to go that oh, show and that showed them <laughs> <laughs> yeah Southwest Airlines. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you just get there and hope you get a good seat, I guess. So we um, we went to a couple of couple of sessions, yeah, we didn't we? But this is the first one, first world championships we've been to since twenty thirteen. Yeah, we've done loads of Europeans, Commonwealth, indoors. World indoors, everything, yeah, everything. But, um, sometimes an actual world championships, you kind of want to watch at home. Yeah, because you just. You know, as we've all been here, it's been amazing. This has been such a brilliant, brilliant championship. But I don't know what's going on. <laughs> it's not, I can't keep up with my Twitter feed either. But you do want to watch the TV broadcast yeah. after and like digest want, You it. want a phone and a laptop and two screens, you know, and your friends on Twitter letting you know what's going on. Um, when you're here. Also, when you're here, and you know this better than anybody, like we're down often in the media zone. Yeah. There's one TV which you can't see because everyone's stood in front of it. It smells awful. It's disgusting. It's so hot. It's so hot. <laughs> it's only getting worse. Athletes. <laughs> <laughs> athletes come through I don't even know what happened and that's why you know my pet hate is journalists who ask how did that go yeah. because it's not a question right it's a really bad question the reason we ask that is because we've no clue <laughs> catch me up we've no clue what just happened I once overheard an, an, an American guy and it was in, in Moscow and he was from like the Idaho press or something he'd somehow wangled like this some accreditation to Moscow <laughs> and he was doing it just for himself and he was stood next to me the whole time and he kept asking questions because he didn't really know what he was doing and at one point this American athlete came past him and he said 
I'm sorry, that was a terrible American accent. <laughs> <laughs> we won't do our British accent. <laughs> he, he said, how did that go? And she went, I came last. <laughs> she said, I kind of walked off. And I've always been scared of asking that question ever since. Because, like, <laughs> I do find myself pulling up my phone and like trying yeah, to refresh. Yeah, really in a, quick, in a bad panic, right? <laughs> Although we, we crashed the World Athletics website yesterday. Yes. So, many, yes. so many people were tuned fault? in. But yeah, I, I just kept refreshing, refreshing, refreshing. <laughs> no, I think it's Shakari's fault. <laughs> like, for the, They've never expected to have that many people checking results yeah. at mm-hmm. one time and the, the site tanked. That's yeah. not an official World Athletics stance no, that's on what cl- happened. That's clearly but. what happened. Yeah. <laughs> that is a state. So in 2009, the IWF, which was what World Athletics was previously <laughs> yeah. known by. Well, unfortunately, we still call them, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it slips Na- up every now and then. Named yeah. you guys the best athletics fans in the world. No, the most famous. The most famous. famous. Like, I mean, they're okay. Come they're on. not the but, best. But, but also, is there, was there a lot of competition? <laughs> <laughs> but there is actually That's a true. funny story behind that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, IWF as they were then, they had asked us to come and do some interviews in the mix zone. We were kind of the first people ever to be in a mix zone with our cameras um, filming the athletes for like social media. It used to go, I think, on our blog and on YouTube and Athletes Weekly, not so Athletes Weekly, sorry, World Athletics would use it for the Spikes magazine, wasn't yep. it? So the online version of Spikes magazine. So they asked us to come over and do that. We'd already bought our tickets. We bought really expensive tickets, like right by the finish line. They asked us to come, handed us a VIP pass and basically just put Usain Bolt in front of us or come on, you're interviewing David Rudisha, you know, and we were kind of completely, completely thrown, but it was the best, the, yeah. the best championships we've ever been to. I'm totally sorry, I've forgotten your original question. Yeah, why, why are we the, why are we the most <laughs> famous? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, okay. okay. But it's really cool to hear that like you guys were the first, they walked so we could run. Yeah, yeah. thank you yeah. for setting the stage. But what happened one day, they said to us, come into town and we're going to do a panel in one of the like fan zones or something. It was, uh, uh, like beneath the Brandenburg Gate. This yeah. is some kind of event and you come down and we're like, I think okay. it was Jonah Hayes was going to interview yeah. us, wasn't it? So we said, you're going to be on stage in front of a crowd and you'll be interviewed as the world's most famous athletics fans. That's what they called us, which we thought was hilarious and so we get there and we go into that the call room behind and there's me and Jody and Frankie Fredericks <laughs> and Heike Dreschler and Anna Kiro <laughs> And, and like, then we got dragged on stage with Michael Johnson. With Michael Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> like, what, like, uh, talk about imposter syndrome. Like, yeah. what, what are we doing here? You know, we in front of like a thousands of fans. Like, oh, it's just. And here they are, the world's most famous <laughs> athletics fans. And we're like, Hi. <laughs> it's like we don't have a mascot. <laughs> <laughs> so, Be like them, everyone. <laughs> so, like, we do still use that on social media, but it's like it, for us, it's a joke, right? So yeah, I hope yeah. people don't take us seriously when we've written that. Well, like, this is 2009. It, exactly. Yeah. As if it was like Miss. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it had me wondering. Like, when's the last time they awarded that <laughs> title? Why haven't we but won? I think it's like winning the Olympics. Like you're forever Olympic champion. Yeah. You know when people say past Olympic champion, former, yeah. former Olympic champion. No, There's no such no thing. Such thing. Yeah. So uh, we claim that title and we're gripping hold of it. <laughs> That's right. That would be such a good award to give out every single. <laughs> like, totally. Year. I think like last year you give it to. The Norwegian guy, yeah, the Norwegian guy at the World Championships, and like every year, yeah, you find great fans. So, for our American followers who maybe aren't super familiar, can you give us like a little origin story and how this whole thing started? How our love of track, uh, we always say athletics, (laughs) but we're not (laughs) track and field. How our love of track and field started, yeah, and then I guess also the media side, the podcast. I mean, the podcast, of course, the podcast. So, so I don't know. Our tenth birthday cake was in the shape of an athletics track. So my mum made it and with little matchstick people and she did a pole vault vault and and like stuff like that. So that was a long time ago. (laughs) So I don't, I don't know specifically. Um, I think um, especially in the eighties in the UK, football was like the predominant, what soccer is the predominant sport. (laughs) You keep having to translate for them. (laughs) And still is the predominant sport. But in the eighties, it was very, very, very aggressive and masculine. There was riots every weekend. Uh, British clubs weren't allowed to play in Europe because they were always rioting and people were getting killed. It was really crazy. And I guess as a counter to that, we went to a sport that's a lot more attractive. <laughs> like, you know, there was, um, to this day, I think the, the love of athletics is that there is something for everybody. It doesn't matter if you're five foot tall or seven foot tall, there's an event for you, you know, from every part of the world. It's possibly the, the main sport that's got complete mixed genders. You know, there's something for everybody. So we, I, that obviously we were attracted to that when we were young. And we were very obsessive about it when we were young. I mean, but it was also really high profile in the UK. Yes, that's you know, true. Because we you had really you, big... You can't understand, you know, when you come to Europe as Americans, it's a whole different ball game, isn't it? You know, yep. we... Um, 
as it's it's a big big sport here and it's one of the big sports in, in Britain it's not as big as you know football which never will be but it's still a very big sport and if you are a top ranked um, world Olympic champion in Britain you are one of the most famous people in the country you yeah. know if you world athletics just had that publication come out where they they counted how many articles and coverage every country had GB was way out in front. Really? Uh, really? Like you guys are covering really? the sport yeah. more. Okay. <laughs> the US way down the list is us. But it's also when you go to a championship, other than the like host country, it's almost always more British fans in a stadium yeah. than in the other yeah. country. So as in when we were kids, you know, we had Seb Coe and Daley Thompson and Steve Cram and Fatty with Fred, Tessa Sanders and all these big, big stars. And I think from there, it just kind of started. But we just didn't just... Follow it a bit. We became very, very obsessive. We remember, this is, I, I'm so proud of us still about this. <laughs> when we were like kids, like 13, 14, we used to go to um, Crystal Palace, which was the big athletic stadium in Britain. And we would go, we wanted to meet all the big athletes. So we would go very early. You would, there was a swimming pool that was adjoined to it. We'd pay to go swimming. We didn't even have a swimming kit with us. We just used to <laughs> pretend, we'd pay like two pounds or something to go swimming. <laughs> we'd then sneak round the back onto like the warm up area. And just stand there, me athletes. But we'd be very, very quiet. We'd stand <laughs> in the corner, and then some big athlete would come past. We say, "Excuse me, can I have a photo?" And then we'd go back, and we just got away with it. We did it for years, didn't we? <laughs> 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 so from a very early age, we were like, we were always going to be like proper obsessive um, track fans. And then obviously later, we started going to lots of meetings. And when we first started going, we were the same age as a lot of the athletes. Yeah. So the first time we ever went abroad was '97. 98, the St. Petersburg, what was then the European Cup. And we got to this, this crazy hotel in St. Petersburg, and that's a and strange place. It had like 2,000 yeah. rooms or something. <laughs> it had, like, it had um, like seven restaurants. It had a bowling alley and a disco in the <laughs> basement. And all the, all the British athletes thought we were from the French team. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, they'd never seen us do sport. But, like, they, so, but we like, ended up making friends with all of them. And like, for the next 10 years, we knew all of the athletes. So we used to go to all the meetings. And then back in London, what we do day to day is... Um, um, I'm a car we're casting directors, we've got a model agency, an acting agency, so everything to do with casting and advertising and model scouting, we scout models. Um, I was on a TV show in, in the UK, um, which was a scouting show, which is like scouting models all over the, all over the country. And Ernie Obeng, who used to be head of like... TV rights or communications something, yeah, or something. Communication or something for, for World Athletics, who we knew because he was a sprinter. He was actually from Ghana, but he ran in, a lot in the, I think he lived in the UK um, in, the, in the 80s. So we knew who he was anyway. We were at an event, I'm going to say it was a World Cup in Stuttgart or something. Something, like something, something random. And he said, I've just seen, what, who are you? <laughs> and we're like, well, what do you mean? He said, because I see you at every athletics meeting. You don't look like all the other fans. And I've just seen you on TV. So what are you, and I'm like, well, we just love athletics. He said, well, do you want to come and do some interviews for World Athletics? And we're like, yeah, what? <laughs> you, you would. <laughs> you didn't have to ask twice. No, exactly. So that's how it started. And that was 2009 was the first time we did stuff for them. So we did stuff for World Athletics for a few years. Um, it was a fun thing to do, but also we're fans. So what we really want to do is sit in the stadium and watch sport. But when you're downstairs all the time, and it was, you know, we're working on behalf of them. You have to interview this person. You, we're like... This isn't for us. And there was, you know, there was some other... <laughs> we won't go into all of it. Right now, but there, there, there was some other stuff. There were some other reasons. Check our social I read the blog. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> and um, so we became out of favour with World Athletics. But that's fine. We'll just do it we for ourselves. We got drops like a hot potato. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they came back. They right? came back, yeah. They came back. Um, they had so a great <laughs> moment at the Tokyo Olympics. And yeah. All that. yeah. So, um, so we just thought, listen, we love doing this. We love going to the athletics, but we love chatting to athletes. And athletes like chatting to us because we don't have an agenda. We don't have an editor telling us we've got to get a headline or you know we've got nobody backing us we're just doing this for fun we also know what we're talking about yeah, a lot true. of um track um journalists it's not their primary understandably you know maybe there's not enough money to be made of full-time track journalists all the time so a lot of them do other sports and then they come into this and they know a bit about enough to interview people right they follow like 80 like, percent of the year exactly right? and yeah. that's perfectly fine but like athletes would come to us and we'd be asking them like the minutiae, you know, and they're like, oh yeah. God, you've done your homework. Yeah. And we were like, we haven't really done our homework. <laughs> we, we, we just watch it properly, yeah. you know, we just watch it a lot. Um, and so it got really, um, it became really clear quite um, quite soon, you know, that people liked talking to us. We were friends with a lot of the athletes. We were nearer their, we're no longer nearer their age, but right. at, the begin, at the beginning <laughs> we were nearer their age and we kind of had a, a really good rapport with them, you know, in a way that some of the older people yeah. Well, that, like that's a big. <laughs> this is us. Yeah, it's <laughs> us. I mean, like, there's a in the U.S. We're trying to make a bigger initiative for sure in terms of just like changing what that mix zone looks like sometimes for the athletes, and like that's 
important. Uh, it's important work to just like, if you look around, like it's not the same old white guys who've been covering the sport for thirty plus years. I mean, like, granted, respectfully, they do good work, and there's uh, a place for that. But I think like we also just need the younger voices. The black women in well, the, the space. Bayo and I were talking about this this morning, yeah. and I said the, the the women in because there's no there's never any women anyway, right? Yeah. And there's there's one in the media eight hundred. There's one women's heat, and then there's ten eleven yeah. men's heat. And there's certainly historically been no black women, and often there's not many black people at all. And, right. and, and when we started, all the mainstream journalists hated us. Hated, hated us. us. Like, literally would go make complaining about us, saying, what are you doing here? You're not athletes, you're fans. We're like, yeah, exactly. Caitlin, that's why we're here. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's what, that's what we were saying. Like, how brilliant it has been at these championships to see you there, to see Inside Track there, to see... Um, to um, there. Yeah. yeah. Like, you've changed the game. Just, just you three being there, or four, this four, in, in our little corner, right? And what's happened is people have... And, in, and also in the press conferences... With like we went to the original press conference at the start of these championships with Seb Co mm -hmm. and the meet you know the chairman and that and we often don't ask questions because we our main thing is the podcast it's the Backstreet Boys podcast so me asking a question in a press conference is not much use because we don't it's just not we relevant can't, can't use it no, it's right. not really useful so they were everyone was asking these boring questions like so boring and um, afterwards somebody with Seb said to us why don't you guys ever ask a question. And we're like, please ask a question because we're sick of these repetitive <laughs> questions, right? And that was, we were like, why don't we ask questions? And it feels like we've been doing this for a long time. And even still, we sometimes feel like we don't belong. And the fact that you, you ladies of time have taken your space, asked questions when, that needed to be asked, and put other people on notice yeah. that things are changing. And there is this weird dimension in the mix zone this it's week. It's really weird. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Well, it, and that's, it was, because of, that's because of the, these ladies. Something has shifted. The new, um, the new generation are coming. Yeah. Um, we are probably of the older generation. <laughs> we're, we're, the, we're, we're, it's, we're in the middle. We're in the same category as that. We're the younger. Yeah, it's <laughs> spirit with the younger. Yeah. But it's been really, really interesting. And I think that people, uh, world athletics are having to take notice because it can't carry on what it is. And it's nothing to, this is nothing against the people who have been doing their jobs and doing them well for years, but There's space they for don't connect yes. with the athletes in the way that you're going to need to in this new digital media age. You know? But instead of standing around bitching about it, <laughs> has anyone come up to you and said, hi, has anyone offered you a job? We've been here for 14 years and no one's ever asked, like, we, you know, every now and then someone wants us to do something for free. But like, you know what? But that's fine with us also. You know, we like, we, we have, have, we have full-time jobs. We have full-time yeah. And we run businesses, yeah. right? This is fun for us, and we don't really want to do. We don't really want to be paid for it because <laughs> then we have <laughs> responsibility. <laughs> Whenever anyone asks us to do something, we're a bit like, oh god, do we have to? Um, <laughs> it's, we don't want that responsibility <laughs> because then it takes the fun out of it, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just it's a very weird dynamic. And I was meant to. I was sorry, we're talking over Caitlin here. Caitlin yeah. Hutchison is yeah. in the room <laughs> yeah. for those Bayo, listeners at home. Bayo and I said when we get to the stadium today, we need to speak to those ladies yeah. and just we're, we're gathering you together for a pep talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, and I look, I'm a diehard track fan and I appreciate the journalists asking the hard questions, but I also think that there is an element of having fans, whatever the hell we are, <laughs> yeah. in, in the, the mix zone as well, because the ability to see a familiar face, someone that you're comfortable with, someone who you know isn't going to maybe like try to capitalize on a real difficult moment, that also gets and elicits a different response that is important and valuable. And then you also do need someone to ask the really hard doping question. It's that balance, and I think they can coexist. I also do think that it's not just on the media. I think that athletes have to understand that these guys, even if we're saying things are going to change, they do have a job to do, and they have a difficult job, and they're getting it in the ear from their organizations who do need a headline. We do want to keep you know, track. It can't just be on social media. Yeah. It does need to be in broadsheets. It does need to be on television. They do have a different different point of view and a different demographic that they're aiming yeah. to. So I do think that athletes have to give them a bit of a break as well and understand where they're coming from. I think it's incumbent on both sides to give and take a little bit. Definitely. That's an important point too, because you, you see that sometimes athletes, you know, you just had the most difficult moment and you want to have a little bit of time to process yeah. before you get a a camera shoved in your face. And we've seen that this championships already. 
And so it's like, how do you give someone enough time to process, but then also allow them to make a statement? And maybe that isn't a five minute interview with really, really tough questions, but make a statement to the press. And then if you are more comfortable talking to someone who you're familiar with, then you can also get additional information there. What often happens, which people wouldn't know, you know, watching it, is when you're in a mix zone, someone will stop, say they just stop for myself and Jody. That often happens. Someone who, you know, we know will stop for us. Then I go to start my question and suddenly I have, not joking, 20, yes. 30 people behind me all shoving either cameras or phones. And then you, you the onus is on you to have a- And also we're going to ask something. We're not going to ask the deep question, right? right? So, yeah. And then so, there's this pressure from all of these people behind us, like tutting that we're asking some trivial questions. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's really nerve wracking for you when you've got, if I'm just having a chat with someone, fine. If I'm having a chat with someone and there's like 30 people behind spectators. me- Spectators. Spectators, yeah. Actually what I'm doing, it throws but you- disdainful, completely. disdainful spectators disdainful as well. Disdainful spectators, but also think of the person you're- interviewing who came up to have a chat with me who they know and suddenly they're surrounded by a whole lot of people they maybe didn't want to talk to you don't see that side the, the people the viewers they only see the, the athlete maybe not giving a great interview but that's because there's a whole row of people yeah. in front of them like i got a little heated about this at the u.s championships at one point this year they had a, a basically like a creator zone so you came through and you did the more traditional press and then in the back room they had a creator zone and when Shakari finished her race and won she went and she spoke with t only one to only speak t. with t yep. that's fine and then all of the traditional journalists who were complaining about the existence of the creator zone then <laughs> run into the other room to try to you know steal the interview yeah and i was just like guys like that's not the point of all of this and clearly you should respect her desire to only speak with t and it's just a disaster and sometimes i feel like i i wonder if your average fans who are not in the mix zone even care about this and maybe we're just talking about yeah. it more because we're involved in it but it is look like those are stories being told and it's either we get some story or we get no story yeah 100 percent. and but i just think it's really important that we don't throw the What's the, what's the Baby saying? Out with the yeah, water, is that like, what you're trying to say? There's, there's room for everybody. Yeah, and everyone exactly. needs to be respected in that space. And, you know, these things are going to change. Things are going to change. But so. I think on our, on our podcast, we have people on for a chat. Yeah. It's literally, yeah. They come on for a chat. It's not a hard-hitting news thing. And people, it's really nice. When we actually go to a championship, we have so many people coming up to a chat. The Bat Straight Boys. Or <laughs> we had someone on the tram the other day tap, tap Jody in the shoulder and goes, listening to you now <laughs> <laughs> that's really good cool. cool. yeah. a little pre-game yeah. um, so it's really really nice to actually have people come up to you and say this because you know we're just doing it throwing it out there you can see you know, there's plenty of people listening but you don't actually know what the what the response is um so it's you know you come here and people actually come up to you and congratulate you and say oh, i really like this or i didn't like that i don't say that much do they <laughs> no they, they, they tend to say they like it what's not um, to like what's not to like exactly <laughs> but our, our thing is to get people on we just want a nice chat with them you know to get to know them and often it's us with our and you get more people you get more people that way don't you yeah no 100 percent uh so you said you've had the opportunity to have bolt in front of you all the, some of these legends is, are there is there anyone left kind of like on your checklist of like we want that sit down well ours no ours are less about the actual interview we're obsessed with meeting like old stars from the past it's all very well you know meeting a Shakari Richardson or something, but I'm way, way, way more excited to meet an obscure, like, shot put champion from 1972. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? Is it just, it's, just it's, it's the nerdiness of it, you know? It's like, it's like almost, they're legend. So, he, he, uh, our well. favourite moment uh, at athletics meetings, well, there's, there's two, but we went to the European Championships in 2002 in Munich. It's in Munich, it's in Germany, right? So we're going there thinking, oh, we might meet some old stars from like GDR, right? <laughs> Who you never expect to meet, you know, you're not going to meet these so, people. But we're there, and this is back in the day when we didn't ever have accreditation, we just got drunk and did whatever we liked. So we're sat, we go and sit next to the VIP section, and we're like literally stand looking, looking like this. We said <laughs> binoculars sometimes. Yeah, we said binoculars. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then we decided we can't get close enough, so we just climbed into the VIP section. And nobody said anything. Yeah. Right. And so there's us, there's Lamine Diak sitting directly behind us. <laughs> the head of World Athletics <laughs> at the time. Yeah. yeah. And we just thought, what, if they want to chuck us out, come and chuck us out. It's not a problem. We don't care. So but there's all these women here, and we're like, who are you? And there's this one woman. She was really tall and she had this red leather outfit on. And I was like, you know when you know someone's got to be someone? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know who you are. You don't look like anybody that I remember as being like a uh, thrower from East Germany. In the so I just grabbed her thing. Who are you? 
And it was Martine Hellman, who's like the 88 Olympic discus champion. <laughs> you have never seen someone have such a meltdown as me. <laughs> she thought I, she thought we were absolutely crazy. We may have been absolutely crazy. We were absolutely yeah. crazy, yeah. We're like, we're like, so I had photos with her. And then we just go into the VIP and it's everybody. Like all these, Ulrike Mayfarth, the 1972 Olympic high jump champions there. Like, Marley's, Marley's girl, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Diana Gansky. It was, just, it was like absolute heaven. Like heaven. <laughs> Our younger viewers are so confused. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so but confused. they were confused. Everyone was confused. But, but it, it was we. And it, another time was we went to the World Athletics I did centenary. Like centenary in 2012 in in Barcelona. They had this big centenary dinner, and we, you know, we they liked us then, so we got invited. <laughs> we literally going, and it's a sit down dinner. Like, you know, imagine going to the Grammys, right? Yeah, okay. you go to the Oscars or something. Yeah, and meeting not just famous people now, but like uh, they're dead, but like Michael Jackson and Prince are there. You yeah, know, yeah. that's what it was like. Literally, Betty Cuthbert was there, the 1956 <laughs> Olympic 100 200 meter champion. Like I, I was, I was so drunk, I was bowing to people. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm, I'm doing things like finding Ireland Ballas, who's a 64 and 68, no, 60 and 64 Olympic high jump champion, but also Bob. Um, um, you mean no uh, high jumper? Um, Dick Fosbury? Yeah, yes. Dick Fosbury was there. So I'm going, Dick, Dick, come with me. You've got to meet Ireland of Ballas. So I go. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, what? The, the best bit was Betty, oh, <laughs> Betty Cuthbert was there. And Betty Cuthbert was the 56, 100, 200, and 64, 400, 400 champion. champion, right? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> you said before we started that you remember all the old stats better than the new stats. Absolutely. Don't ask me who won anything. Well, this week, I've no clue. But last year, I might be able to name like 10 winners from last year. So Betty Cuthbert's here. We heard Betty Cuthbert was here. Betty Cuthbert um, had um, multiple, sclerosis. multiple sclerosis and was in a wheelchair and comes from Australia. She wasn't going to be there. She's was not she? someone I ever think I'm yeah. ever going to meet Someone in my wildest says, we dreams. Betty Cuthbert's here. Oh my God, Betty Cuthbert's here. <laughs> so we go searching for Betty but Cuthbert. There was a free bar, so yeah. like we were way gone at this and point. We see, we see Betty Cuthbert. She's in a wheelchair with a, with a granddaughter. And we went to a granddaughter. <laughs> Is it okay if we say hello to Betty? She said, Of course you can. She'd love you to. So I sort of knelt and said, Hi, Betty. Lovely to meet you. Meet my brother. I turn around. My brother is nowhere to be seen. <laughs> He's in a corner crying. <laughs> Literally sobbing, absolutely sobbing his heart out in the corner. <laughs> But I literally spent half my night going, oh, there's Paula Radcliffe. Oh, there's Ingrid Christensen. There's Rosa Mota. Right, we have to get them all in the photo together. <laughs> <laughs> I was like shepherding people. No, Rosa, no, no, no. Come over here. Ingrid's waiting but for you. Because you were so drunk. You were so drunk. You had a great I don't red <laughs> it's, like, it's like the Ellen selfie from the Oscars. Yeah. But it's like, yes, exactly, it's exactly what it was. It's the greatest track and field uh, photo in history. Like literally the... Uh, they must I, be so confused. <laughs> so like, confused. Nobody has done this to them in 60 years. No, no one did it 60 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing about athletes. Because athletics, it's a big sport in certain places, yeah. but in other places, it's not at all. So when they come across people who actually are really big fans of theirs and really know all about them, it's really confusing to these people. Because <laughs> often, you know, they can go about their daily lives. They're not like footballers. They're not Beyonce. So they can go about their daily lives until they can, can encounter us two. And we're like, you won the shop in 1983. Helena <laughs> 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 for <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I would have loved like if who so was it who ran away from us from like uh, multiple championships? Oh, this, um, uh, Fraina Melnick. Fraina Melnick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would have loved if someone would have pulled a prank on you and been like Jesse Owens is here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna fall for that. <laughs> I would love. It. I wish we had like a lineup of old stars <laughs> that we could bring on right now. So has anyone left? I guess. It well, this week. JJK, we met yeah. for the first time. Oh. And Gerardo um, Tulu's here as well. Yeah. Okay. So literally the first morning we're in the stadium, we're just waiting, like, you know, by just, and a lot of our friends- <laughs> And the bar, Jen, is what you- Yeah. yeah. Um, um, a lot of our friends, like, a lot of the athletics friends who all go together. So we were standing, I turn around and there's Jackie Joanna Kersey. And I know in America, like she's probably a lot of places, she, I have never even been anywhere in her vicinity before. Like, and there's no one bigger than that. So I was like, Jack, like, <laughs> <laughs> I went running over to her and she's with the, she's here with um, a, uh, uh, Adidas. Adidas, Adidas, yeah. Adidas, okay. Um, and she's with the lady um, from Adidas and we went running over. And I, I saw her cause we went to an event with them the day after and she said, you look like you needed the toilet. She said, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were gonna ask me where the toilet was. And then you went, Jackie. <laughs> But I was wearing Adidas, so she was happy. That's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, but we, so we, we have to come to a champs, especially when it's in a particular country, you're going to get stars from that 
country there, you know, and we do spend a lot of time looking, you know, around to see who we can see. Um, but it, it, I think this is enjoyable, you know. This is the thing that's often missing from track. It's fun. It should be fun. You know, this is an entertainment spectacle. Yes. At the end of the day, sport is entertainment, isn't yeah. it? And so many people take it so seriously. Oh, seriously. It's fun. I, and you know what? I, uh, I think that that gets lost. And if we put the athletes on the platform as being entertainers, that benefits everyone, yes, right? absolutely. And uh, I don't know. We, we've said this multiple times this week. When we're sitting in the stadium, we're just looking around. We're like, how is this not the most popular sport in the entire uh, world? I, I, I don't understand <laughs> how everyone doesn't love this as much as we do. And... and like, so many things 100 percent. i think we we is entertainment sports people have to they have to understand that they're entertainers as well they have to you know we've all interviewed people who give you nothing yeah nothing <laughs> either because Naming no names we all know the ones we, it, either because they you know sometimes they're shy they don't have a lot of personality that's understandable sometimes because they've been media trained into within an inch of their life and they are too scared to say anything but and then you've got the other athletes like for example sorry yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely but like um noah lyles yeah. great interview right he gets it he gets what he's ja, from our perspective jazz sawyer like brilliant brilliant she's she's like she's always on the pod she always stops to talk to us and she she makes she understands when we ask a question what we're trying to do so she helps us athletes gonna have to do that more but also world athletics i'm a little bit like this championships yeah. they've done a much better job than normal it's just like the way they've introduced things it's been much much better but the way they they don't sell the sport that's the problem it's not they sell it badly they don't sell it it's i don't know like an odd tweet or something is not selling the sport they need I've been saying this for years, they need to get outside someone who's an expert in marketing to do it because it all feels very in-house to me. Because to me, like, track and field is so clean, so clear-cut, you know? It's not really... I mean, there's complicated rules when you get really into the minutiae of it, but, like, on the whole, it's who jumps the highest, who runs... And that is, like, superhero stuff, you know? The fastest person in the world, the strongest person in the world, the, the highest person in the world. All this stuff is should be easily sold you know this person well, every can, continent yeah. of the world this yeah. person can jump over sizes you know, and shapes yeah. to both jet like it's just it's it <laughs> and yeah i don't know why it's so difficult something that i think is interesting that you made a good point of i actually think world athletics is doing a better and better job yeah, every their job. social media team i think yeah, does yeah, a really good job and everything yeah. but it is really important to have media outlet and totally biased obviously but media outlets besides just the major rights holders of like World Athletics or USATF, like those small content creators who can go and make really cool videos that get people excited, reach a new audience. And it's like the more and more people that are creating, the more stories that are being told because there's so many that it's difficult for one brand, one well, company to be able to tell them the, all. The overall thing, the overarching thing they've got to sort out is the Diamond League, which is just a mess, you know, and nobody really understands it quite, do they? Um, it doesn't... It's not consistent on a consistent day. I think that's the single most important One day, thing. it's on a Wednesday. Next week, there's one on a Friday and one on a Sunday. Then there's not one for two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's complicated because World Athletics doesn't own, own the Diamond yeah, League. Exactly. And so that's like a huge issue, obviously. And then every single meet is part of the Diamond League, but is independently Independent, run. Yeah. And you so know, there is no... Which has different days that they want to do things, which have different television rights, which has, you know, it's the stadium might not be available. There's all kinds of... I understand it's very complicated. Yeah. But it never used to be this complicated. But I'll say this. Watching two hours of Diamond League television sitting down is now very good. Where do you watch it, though? In the UK, <laughs> yeah. that's the thing, you know, yeah. in the UK, usually it's on the BBC, but it might be on BBC One, it's one channel, it might be on BBC Two, it might be on BBC Three. Maybe it's not on terrestrial TV, maybe it's online. Maybe it's not online, maybe it's on iPlayer, which is, like, what? Do you is know it, what it is in the US? It's on Peacock, which is a streaming platform behind a paywall. Yeah. Yes, but at least you know, and, uh, yes, but and we, we do have something it's similar on for the, NBC or CNBC sometimes. Yeah, but it's, it's all over. We know. have the Golden League, which is on a pay, behind a paywall, but why some, it can't be someone somewhere must be able to work out how to get it all in one place. I will happily when, pay for it when we if miss, it's all in one place. When we miss them, because we weren't sure it was on, you know, what is the regular view? No, no. what is the unre What's the unregular? What's the um, casual? <laughs> casual, casual, thank you. <laughs> um, viewer doing, you know? Um, so if they can, and I think at the press conference, like Seb Crow was saying recently, that's one of the main um, priorities for them in going forward is to make sure that everyone knows that Thursday night is Diamond League Light or something like that. Really that. Cool. It really would be amazing, really would. wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. What is the best date and time for a track meet? The problem is it's different. 
in different, different places. Times, yeah. <laughs> that, that's that's genuinely the problem. Yeah, oftentimes in the US, it's like during the work day. Yeah. And so it's, it's like nice to have it up on the second laptop <laughs> while working. So why would you put it on during the day? Uh, well, if it's, it's in it's Europe. Oh, so we can watch it you in guys Europe. Watch it yeah. in oh, got you. Okay. So yeah. ours is often at 12 p.m. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Which is an interesting time. <laughs> back back, back in the day, we always used to know in Britain that athletics was on a Friday night. Yeah. And it would get huge, huge viewing figures because you knew it was like an appointment television on a Friday night. That's when it was. But of course, that's not different, that's that's how television what, works anymore. You don't necessarily watch it live, do you? You mm -hmm. know, you might record it to watch later. You might, um, you know, watch it in pieces on, on the website. So it's, it's a very tricky one. You might to learn all the results on Twitter before you ever get to see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the other thing that's really interesting is, you know, some, a lot of races across the board will have paywalls. You don't know how to watch it. And then the second the race finishes, you see it on the internet. And it, it, look, I'm appreciative because I want to be able to watch that race again and again. But it is a very different experience when you watch a 100 meter race in 12 seconds. Yeah. versus the, the 10 minute build up the context the storylines and all of that and that's an important part some of, of it. the most nerve-wracking moments of my entire life have been the build up to races that i wasn't in <laughs> 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 what were you guys like at the 2012 olympics once we didn't go oh you didn't go no, just again it was that it was that, it was that whole um um you have to so this is the 2012 olympics specifically was dreadful a year before you had to enter a lottery and say what level of ticket you were happy to receive. Didn't know what level, what the levels the were, were, or where they. You knew the prices, but you didn't know where the seats were. So, for example, the head, the most expensive tickets at the bottom near the two hundred meter start, because they thought they were closer to the action, and we're like, that's the worst seat in the entire house. <laughs> <laughs> so we spent a lot of time going. I don't. I'm not. And it was hundreds and th like it would have been thousands of pounds to buy lots of tickets. So we just said, let's just watch it on TV. We went to some other sports. We went to the closing ceremony. Closing ceremony was amazing. I love watching athletics on on TV. Yeah. I like to know who what the reaction times were. I want to know why Eva Shreboda is suddenly in, got a lane when she didn't have a lane two seconds ago. I want to know all that kind of stuff. So it, they've done a good job here, though. I think of communicating things better than most track meets. Like we knew, I think in the stadium that Shreboda had been added. I before. knew she. Had, yeah, no, I knew she had, but I didn't know why. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, I, yeah. You know, like, we need the minutia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seb decided. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm really pleased they did that, and they should do that more. Yeah. I hate when they take things down to a thousand. That's such. Nonsense. Yeah, it's um, one centimeter, right? When you have yeah, so. when you have the lane, you might as well yeah, use exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you can run out of. And lane she went well. She went a PB. Yeah, yeah. And did, I don't, did you see the reaction of yes. her in the mix zone finding yeah. out? Yeah, it was really. How did you come and run cool. a PB after all of that drama? Um, can you remember the time in your fanhood that you lost your mind the most? Like what? Oh, what? Yeah, when I'd, did when you I didn't, explode? Yeah. Christina Horogu. I'm guessing it was 2000. I guess it was 2007 because that was more of a surprise. And I did an involuntary roly poly across my living room. <laughs> <laughs> no, you had to quite explain that properly, Jay. <laughs> oh no! Also, right. So she she'd had you know she'd missed the test when that whole testing thing had just started. So. Yeah. Um, a very unfortunate situation for her. I don't think anyone thinks it was intentional at all. But um, so she'd missed them. She'd come back and she'd been selected, but she hadn't run. And she ran one race in China. No, it was, so it was in Osaka, wasn't it? So she it was somewhere in Japan. She'd run once and she went 50.5. And we saw the result. And we were like, that's interesting. And she was 50 to one. So I was like, oh, I'll put some money on her. So, <laughs> <laughs> so she won. I won, I mean, thousand pounds or something and then the next year at the olympics because she because she she's not swans out on the circuit running every time she was 50 to 1 again i was like she's world champion why is she 50 to 1 so i did the same again wow. <laughs> he made a fortune <laughs> and that's when he did an involuntary roly-poly across yeah. the middle floor <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> do you remember yours um i mean i felt when cat when KJT won the heptathlon here, I actually fell down the stairs crying, didn't I? That really? Was, yeah. That was bad. Uh, my worst one is, and this is this is this is really obscure. Um, in, no. Two, in 2014, was it? Joe Pavey, oh, yeah. British 10,000 meter yeah, runner. Yeah. She won the 10,000 Europeans and she was like 40. Yeah. Um, I was having a really, really bad week at work. I was there in the stadium, but I had this concert going back and forth and back and forth to like have an argument with someone about this and that. And so when she won, I just burst into tears. Um, I think it was half work and half Joe Payne. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a hilarious photo. picture of me like, throbbing like this, <laughs> which we use quite regularly. Can you remember yours? <laughs> oh, man, I don't know. Um, I do remember 2016 Olympics, Wade Van Niekerk breaking the world record. I was just like, I think the first time I'd ever seen like a world record like in person. And Tim Layden, who was uh, my colleague at Sports Illustrated at the time, just like kind of like, 
grabbed me. He was like, world record, and like shook me. And I was like, I was like, holy crap. I was like, I got to tweet. Like, <laughs> so immediately, cool, like, sprung if, back into action. If you don't tweet, it didn't happen, right? If we don't tweet That's it. like the whole thing, too. It's just sort of like, for me, it's hard to like, yeah, I enjoy the moment in real life, but then it's immediately like, you got it. You gotta be on it, like so. I have to say, I feel like I remember things better when I've watched them on television than I do when I'm there. When you're there, they happen, and then they're kind of gone. You know, yeah. Yeah. when it happens on television, they happen, and then you see replays of them, and then you go out to the studio to talk about it, and then like, so it feels like it embeds itself in your brain more than moving straight onto the next. I've I've, I've got to also mention when Merlin Notti won the 293 because you know Merlin, she's the bronze queen. Yeah. Um, and she eventually, I mean, she almost didn't when she stopped running 10 meters before the line. I think she had a panic, so that was amazing. And then there's something I'm sure you've all seen, which is when Karsten won the. <laughs> yeah, that race, we were together for that one. Yeah. And when that one happened, like, we had just like a moment where we just like got up out of our seats and we were just like, holy shit. And we were like just processing the, all of the results. And so I'm particularly excited for that race here as well. Like, oh my yeah. God, yeah. But I mean, obviously, World Athletics were, were filming us. When yeah. We watched that. <laughs> yeah. I actually forgot, we, we, I were forgot few cocktails, we were a few cocktails in as yeah. well. And it was like two in the morning. Yeah. And um, we did go. I mean, what? I, I, to this day, I'll never get my head around that. We uh, don't speak for about, we're like live on camera. We don't speak for about 35 seconds. We just go, Wah! It's, like, it, it just, <laughs> it's a great clip if people find it, did, it, on, it did, on the internet. It still didn't doesn't compute, compute, does it? No. And the fact that they're talking about it potentially being faster this time around, like, I am so excited. I'm still speechless. There's still also, I have to say, one. another one we were being filmed totally by chance, wasn't it? We put, we lucked out um, when we got two golds in the high jump. And um, I say we. We didn't get two yeah. golds. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's when you know that like, you're a great sports fan. It's like when you're referring to you and, and just the team as we. But that's what every other sports every other fan sport. does. It's like, we, oh, won, we won. Oh, we won. We won, yeah. yeah. But um, Barshem uh, Bar and um, Tamberi got two golds. And just when they said... Can we can we both have a gold or something? And I just uh, it's just just me it's on just camera. Him just him crying, just basically. Me crying. That's the story no. of us going to. Oh no, me as well. Yes, both I'm crying. Right. I just keep saying it's so Olympic. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been the same as the world champs. World no, champs were jumping off. It genuinely wouldn't have because in my head it was like this about the world coming together and everyone being happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Why is it's this not so the most Olympic. popular sport in yeah. the world? I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So like. How can we, you know, clone you guys to ha fill Hayward Field like in the near future or something like that? Because I feel like, you know, to the point of just like the experience at this meet at some of the European Diamond Leagues, there's no empty seats. Like mm -hmm. it's a full crowd like and we're on this big mission in America to hopefully have some of that. You know, in the lead up to the 28 Olympics, the 28 Olympics will be full because, yeah. like, it's, the Olympics. it's an Olympics. Yeah. But, like, in the meantime, like, how can we make more of you? Or just sort of just, like, what what should we be looking for to tap into new track fans? What I don't understand from an American perspective is you have the, we always call it the NAACP, don't we? The, <laughs> the, the NCAA. NCAA. Yeah. There is nothing, <laughs> there is no equivalent. Yeah, both. <laughs> yeah. There's no equivalent around the whole world, you know? And so you have for a chunk of, you know, the young people's lives up until like 21, 22, whenever they leave college, you have these huge rabid fan bases for their team, you know, which is their, the university that the college they go to. And then it fall, just falls away. That doesn't translate after that to people actually watching track itself. Is that, yeah. is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so is it, is it the team nature of what the, the people are c competing? Yeah. Uh, 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 there's uh, that, there's a school affiliation to it. People just, I feel like are really invested in their own careers a lot of the time in the NCAA and just like our whole system. And they don't really look outside as much. And how yeah. do you get them interested? But you can sell out stadiums for like college meets, can't you? But bring the whole world sometimes in and <laughs> a lot of parents. <laughs> okay, right, right. <laughs> it's not that many general track fans are just flying down to NCAA's just to watch. But there must be some way of capturing, like in the UK, like and I'm in the US as well. But road running is really popular. Yeah, yeah? and there's lots of um, there's, there's one called the Running Channel or something, which um, Andy yeah, yeah. Badley, yeah. Um, and we, I was talking to him a, a few weeks ago at the night of the ten thousand PBs. And he's like, you know, I put something up about um, a training session. We get hundreds of thousands of views. If I put anything touching on actual athletics, like, you know, this is the world record holder for the 5,000 metres, no one's interested. We have a thing called Park Run in the UK where every, like, by me, three local parks near me, 
five hundred people turn up to run five k every. But but they know nothing about actual athletics or people who run five k's. There must be a way of harnessing the because there is an interest out there. Yeah. It, and it's the most basic of sports, right? That everybody does. Everybody's done. Everybody's done it at some point. There must be a way. I don't know what it is. It's not my. This is not my. What I do. But like, there must be a way of harnessing that, of tapping into that. Yeah, that's always been like the target one that like the shoe companies and everyone's like we've been targeting like we got to connect both of those packs. Mm-hmm. But then I also think like a lot of the effort should be put towards like the young track athletes who are getting involved in the sports. Like let, let's find a way to keep them and also make them aware of like what's going on on the top end. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a battle that we've uh, chosen to take on, uh, <laughs> and it's going to be a long road ahead. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Keep trying. Yeah. Well, uh, Jody and Bayo, I think we've got we've to get to the stadium. We do, soon. don't we? Yeah. We need to get to the stadium because there might be an old shop putter there, Jody. We need oh, to. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I appreciate you guys so much for taking the time to do this with us. And uh, hopefully, you know, we exposed you to some of our American young audience. And you could find the Backstreet Boys on podcast. So, what, what's, our, uh, yeah, what was what's that? our name? The Backstreet Boys. Yeah. Uh, uh, good save. <laughs> I think you slipped up. <laughs> yeah, I think you called the back street for a second there. <laughs> it, won't be, it won't be the you first. You can find we- both on Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> We've got many very famous athletes like calling us the Backstreet Boys. So. Really? Yeah. So then you guys are on podcast players, Instagram, yeah. Twitter. And it's just the Backstreet Boys podcast on Instagram and, you know, on in all your favorite podcast platforms. Wherever you listen to podcasts, so, yeah. Um, yeah. and on Twitter as well. I always feel um, that. We're doing like every every night. We've been dropping a pod every night. Um, just a really. Are you going to be our guest tonight? We yeah, need to grab oh, you for ten minutes. Yeah, we've got to yeah figure it out because we've been rushing out of the stadium to get back here to do our post race show. But uh, I'll stay back this time. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll work something. Yeah, out. We, we like we we try and do it all in one take. Then I'd have to do any editing. So. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. No, I love it. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in to another episode of CityS Mag Live at Worlds. We'll be back tonight with our post race analysis after the women's 1500 meter final, the men's steeplechase final, and the women's discus final. So, more gold medals coming to America, I think. Thank you, ASICS, for supporting another episode of CityS Mag Live. Let's go, Val Allman, tonight. Yes. Watch our video that we produced with her uh, a couple, a week ago. So, uh, we'll see you guys tonight. Stability never felt better. The first five miles, you're just getting warmed up. From downtown to uptown, you'll take the scenic route. Tired legs, you'll feel fresh. From first steps to final strides. Steep hills, super steep hills. Long runs, even longer runs. Whatever comes, you can run through it. With stability, cushioning, and more comfort than ever in every step because nothing feels better